Hi everyone, it's Guillaume from Startup Basecamp. Welcome to the Tech for Climate podcast. During the show, you will have the opportunity to meet the best climate tech founders, investors, and experts from both Silicon Valley and around the globe. They will share with you their stories and personal journeys into this growing and exciting industry, giving you some insight into the ecosystems that help you to take part in the fight against climate change and benefit from the opportunities it can represent. Podcast is divided in two small interviews. During the first part, you will get to know our speakers, their perspectives on the climate crisis and how climate tech is changing the game. Second part of the discussion will be for members of our community who will learn the speakers' secret sauce on how to and share with you their unique expertise on topics such as fundraising, management, strategy and so on to help you to become a better leader in your field. So before we start, I would like to quickly share what we are doing at Startup Basecamp to support climate tech founders in accessing resources and gaining visibility with investors they seek. Our initiatives include a membership-based community platform offering access to a dedicated Slack group with a growing number of founders, experts and investors from around the world and a series of exclusive content such as interviews, weekly job listings, events, and our quarterly online pitch of night opportunity. But more than a place where you can learn, exchange, and grow, we are building a matchmaking service to facilitate connections between our members and top investors and experts in the field. And soon, alongside with other top investors, we will be launching a small fund to co-invest in the growth and acceleration of our members. Finally, all of this is possible because of your support and donations. We are a small self-funded team and we want you to be part of this collective movement against climate change. So please share one episode with a friend and subscribe to the channels. As an added bonus, we will plant a tree for each of our subscribers each time we reach 1,000 new fans or donors. Do not hesitate to connect with me via social media or email guillaume at Startup Basecamp. Thanks a lot for listening. I hope to get in touch with you soon. And now, let's go for the show. Hi, everyone. During this new episode of Founder Series, we're sitting down with Shital Bahirat, founder and CEO at Elan James Beverage Company, winner of our sixth quarterly pitch competition that happened last June. Shital is working to extract nutrients out of food waste to create functional products and ingredients through our company Hidden Gems. Our first product, Reveal, is an avocado seed brew containing antioxidants extracted from avocado seeds to make a beverage that is not only good for your gut, but improves the ability of avocado seeds as a way to have a second life and break down in commercial composting. I was very much looking forward to speaking with Shital, who is particularly passionate about food and how it can have such a powerful effect on us, on how we feel, how we interact with others, and how we build community. After several startup ventures, Shital received a master's in culinary arts and sciences, where she learned the technical know-how she would need to tackle the food waste problem. After many iterations, customer reviews, and trial runs, she has brought to market a product that is not only sustainable, but that answers the question, what is an advocate of this beverage even supposed to taste like? And how do I match people's expectations? In this episode, she tells us through the problem of food waste and how it's not just in stores, it's in your fridge, on the farm, in the restaurant, and in that product that you love. By taking us through her own founder's journey, she takes us on another journey through the food waste landscape as we answer some key questions. What is the market opportunity? What are some of the key stumbling blocks? Does regulation serve to hinder or help? Why is it critical to upcycle food waste? During the second part of the talk, Shital gives tips on fundraising and how to tell your founder story in a compelling way to get more attention. She also explains her tips for managing a work-life balance and what that concept means to her. She will also explore what she reads in her free time to find value for her business 
you know, own climate tech space. Shital, welcome to the show. Hi, Shital. Welcome to the Tech for Climate podcast. I'm super happy to have you here with us today for the episode number 52. It's a very exciting uh, time and uh, you're a special guest uh, as you were the winner of the last quarterly pitch competition back in June. And I have to say the jury uh, of VCs were really impressed by your innovative solution contributing to tackle food waste and promote upcycling. So I believe it's going to be a great opportunity to hear your story and learn more about what you're up to with Eden Gems. So welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. And now is the tradition. So before we start, can you give us a 30 second introduction about Hidden Gems? Okay, so Hidden Gems is a company that uh, basically extracts nutrients out of food waste to um, create functional products and ingredients that are innovative. So our very first product is the world's first avocado seed brew. So what we do is we extract the antioxidants out of the avocado seed to make a gut healthy drink that has three times more antioxidants than a green tea. There's apple cider vinegar, so great for your gut health, which is one gram of sugar in every bottle. Fantastic. So before we uh, uncover all of that, let's start from the top. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about your own personal story and background? I mean, what are you passionate about? What do you do or love to do besides building hidden gems? What makes you feel inspired and or like your best self? I mean, as I always ask, who is she tell? Well, um, so I actually grew up all over the world. Um, my parents moved around a lot when I was a kid. So I've been to like 10 different schools from first grade to 12th grade. It was, um, yeah, different schools every year. And uh, later on, I guess, like in my life, uh, it really helped me because now I can talk to anyone and make friends wherever, which is really awesome. Um, and I think the things that are really uh, the things that like drive me and make me happy, I guess, um, is just like, I love to be outside. I love to do yoga. I love to do like physical activities like bike, bicycling cycling um, or hiking, um, just like being outside. I love to be with friends and I am an absolute foodie. I love to cook. I love to eat. I love to, I love the, com I love the community that builds around food. And I, those are like my favorite things in the world. So tell us a bit more about your uh, different work and life experience. And you already mentioned that uh, you grew up in the many different cities. Uh, so prior to the launch of Eden Gems, I mean, what did you learn along the way that, uh, in a way, you would not have if you had a, a different journey? I mean, what do you believe gave you an edge to start the, the company? Well, I think um, one of the things that was most instrumental was the fact that since I was moving around a lot and I did a lot of my primary schooling in California and then I moved uh, to India when I was in eighth grade. So it was like a huge shift for me um, and just that shift and seeing how different my education was um, in the in California, in particular in my school and um, how it different it was in India was just like such a culture shock for me and at the same time it kind of put me in this position to realize like oh i can share all of these things that i have learned with my classmates and with the other students here and so when i was in um my first year of university i had this like startup with a bunch of my friends um we called it seed leads it was really fun um it was like an experiential learning and i was just part of the team but it was like an experiential learning a platform that we were going to do and we were going to go to schools and like teach them so it was like building curriculums and everything and i still remember like we went and signed a contract for i think it was like 10,000 rupees for the full year to teach all the way from first grade to 12th grade i think it was like four times a week um for a full school year and it was like no money um so we went and bought the materials and we were already out all the 10,000 rupees that we got in like day one, um, but we still had to like complete that contract. Um, so we like, you know, had to borrow money from our parents and kind of go through that contract. But that was my first foray into um, business landscape, I guess I would say. And I definitely learned a lot about how to price 
things <laughs> and how to think about the future before I go and like, you know, sign contracts and stuff like that. Um, but that experience did uh, like kind of really spark in me that idea of like, oh, I can actually make something out of nothing, um, which was really fun for me. Um, and then I moved from there after university to start um, a personal styling company. So I was a personal stylist. I was like doing my own, I had like my own consultancy. And then um, I met the founder of uh, this company called Vunik and uh, he, basically wanted to create a personal styling like AI system, like an, uh, yeah, basically a machine learning personal stylist that lived online. And um, he, you know, was looking for people to join the founding team. And it was like such an exciting idea and opportunity that like I could take the decisions that I make on a personal basis and convert that into like an algorithm. So he did that for four years and we grew from like five to 500 people in the four years that I was there and um, just fell in love with the whole startup landscape even more. Um, and while I was doing personal styling, kind of really realized that I love it. I love that world. But at the same time, like, you know, shopping for people wasn't solving their problems. Um, and they were coming to me for to fix issues that were much more deep seated than what like a wardrobe change could fix. Um, and the people that like went in and like stuck to their like the fitness program and the nutrition program that we put together for them and like the self help, uh, like it was almost like a lot of self learning uh, that we did. And like all of those things contributed so much more to like lasting change. So um, that's really where I fell in love with food and the power that food has to like basically change someone's life. Like everything that you put into your body like gives you energy and that energy can like transform your output. It can transform how you look, it can transform how you feel, it can transform how you interact with people and just fell in love with how amazing food as a concept was. Um, started a cold press juice company out of my house with my mom. Um, it was like a subscription based model. It was like super fun but discovered food waste um, along that journey, which I know you have another question later, so I'm gonna save how that happened um, for a little bit later, but discovered food waste, um, ended up at Drexel University to do my master's in culinary arts and science to figure out how we can utilize um, food waste, basically. And um, that's how I discovered how many avocado seeds go into the landfill every week. And I, at that time, realized that like I have the power uh, to change that. Um, and I knew all the technical things that I needed to know um, that I could actually make that difference. So that's how I ended up here. And that's how I guess I'm here talking with you, which is a crazy journey. So but before we, uh, we go uh, more into food waste and, uh, and discover the, the whole process of, uh, of hidden gems, like, do you, I mean, you, you mentioned there's this old journey from the fashion uh, industry and then like uh, not pivoting, but evolving into the, the, the food impact. And then now uh, this, this waste aspect of it uh, that you guys are trying to tackle. But uh, I mean, do you have like any uh, maybe haha moment uh, that in a way you can recall that was really for you like a, a pivoting time where you say, okay, you know what, uh, I really want to uh, my next uh, venture dedicate uh, something that is more in the sustainable and even maybe a, a climate, uh, you know, angle of it uh, that you can, you know, maybe define or share with us. Yeah, so it really happened. That switch for me happened um, like it was I still remember the day so perfectly. Um, it was the next morning we were going to have like it was a pineapple. There was a juice that had pineapples in it um, on the menu. And um, my mom and I, we went out shopping and we found the most beautiful pineapples that I have ever seen in my life. They were like so juicy. They smelled so good. They were like big and beautiful, like um, just the most gorgeous fruit. And I posted about them on Instagram. I made like a video, like, you know, I was like all up. I was like, oh, you know, like, you know, we're going to get our hands on this pineapple. Like it's got so much life to give us. Um, and the next morning, like in like horrification, I was like watching in like um, this pineapple turned into a pile of garbage in like two seconds. It went into the juicer. Half of it was like, OK, we are taking this juice. This juice is valuable. The rest of it is just junk. 
Like, you know, you're going to throw this away. And I was like, wait a second. I've been doing this for months. I've been um, juicing for months without thinking about it because it was just like, okay, yeah, it comes out of the juicer. We don't use it. We just compost it or whatever. And it just goes away. Um, it was the first time that made me stop to think like, but I mean, what does this even like still taste like? Is there still flavor in it? Is there nutrition in it? Is there value in it? Because like, this is like, I mean, we grew the whole pineapple. Like I bought the whole thing. I didn't just buy um, the juice. Like, you know, I bought the whole thing. So like, what can I do with it? And that was really what sparked my journey into figuring out like what we can do with food waste. And I think it was just like the most like, I guess like I didn't even know that I was getting into it. Like it just stumbled into it and it fascinated me. So that's how I ended up wanting to do my master's in it. Okay, well, I think this is a, a good segue to, to move into the, the, the food waste uh, topic. Um, so we would like to, to zoom out a little bit and, you know, and kind of understand this overall context that you are uh, surfing on. So let's try to, to get your overview on the so-called food waste landscape today. I mean, I, I'd like to maybe to start with your opinion regarding this larger question. I mean, why is it critical to upcycle food waste in order in, to slow down, to, to contribute to uh, slow down uh, climate change? Maybe we can, you know, cover with you a little bit like the, the state of, uh, of food waste. I mean, which quantities are we talking about? Uh, which part of it could or have the potential to be upcycled? Because I, I, I mean, I presume that not everything can be uh, upcycled or maybe, uh, maybe it is. Um, what are the existing solutions uh, available today and, and how much is currently upcycled uh, in a way? In, if you have any also like insight about like who are the players? I mean, there's like uh, smaller companies like like you. Uh, is there is like larger players already uh, trying to uh, to upcycle uh, at a industrial scale? I would say. So if you can tell us a bit more about like you know this uh, overall context, and I know yeah. it's a lot of questions. So uh, let's start by uh, let's start the journey together. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, the thing with food waste is that it currently is the number one contributor to climate change. And if it was a country, I think it's going to be like the third most polluting country in the world. Um, and on one side, we have all of this food that's like getting wasted. And on the other side, we have so many hungry people. And a large part of why we even have food waste is because we just don't have the logistical resources to move food from place to place in time. Um, and that's really why, like you'll see like grocery stores will throw out lots of food because you know, it's like they had all this food, people didn't come, people didn't buy it. There's just not enough demand at that level, but then you can't send it anywhere else also right in time. So there's food waste at that level. Then there's food waste at the customer level where it's like we buy stuff from the grocery store. It happens to me sometimes um, and I'm not happy about it, but it's just like, you know, you bought that really cool looking cucumber and it got pushed to the back of your fridge. And then, you know, a week later it's covered in mold and there's nothing that you can do about it. So um, at the customer level, there's also food waste. Um, and then if you're looking at the industry of that manufactures food, then there's food waste at that level as well, um, where people who are, for example, making guacamole will now have hundreds and thousands of pounds of avocado seeds and avocado peels that are technically food waste because um, it came from a food source. You grew the whole thing. Again, uh, when you're growing an avocado, you're not only growing the pulp, you're growing everything. And the problem with those types of uh, food waste is that all of that like still needed the resources to grow. It still took land, it still took water, it still like, you know, uh, utilized all of these nutrients. Um, and now if it's going to landfill, um, all of those nutrients are being wasted and then again starting to pollute because in the landfill they can't break down or if they get composted or they get sent to like animal feed then that's better. A lot of companies have been trying to do that and I think there is a really small niche there of things that like right now currently don't have any other use other than going to landfill. And that's really where Hidden Gems is coming in, is to find those nutrients, those ingredients out of things that are just getting sent to landfill to prevent that from happening. Um, and then there's, I guess, like wastage at the farm level where, um, you know, 
if you've ever been around like an apple tree or if you've ever gone apple picking, like you'll see the amount of apples that are on the floor. And it's just like, I mean, you can't really do like no one's going to buy that. So then it's just like all of that food is wasted, but technically it's a good apple. Um, so there's a lot of waste that happens there. So like at every point in the food system, there is its own kind of waste. And I think every everything has its own set of issues and challenges. And there are people that are working with diff within like different sections of this like food system to like correct that and fix it. So I think there's like some really interesting things that are happening in the upcycled space. And there's lots of different um, types of companies that are coming in to change that. Um, and I think the Upcycled Food Association is doing a great job by bringing everyone together to kind of like create a community and um, like awareness around what we're doing with upcycling. So what are the challenges, and you mentioned some of them, which is literally like the, the, the supply chain uh, challenges, like, um, but what are the, those, you know, maybe there's other main challenges and maybe opportunities that you see uh, in the market to accelerate this, uh, you know, upcycling uh, capabilities. And you mentioned as well, uh, having, you know, uh, grouping uh, all the different actors together in this uh, association as well. But what is blocking or maybe still slowing it down to go mainstream? Is it because of a need for new regulation that are reinforcing uh, producers uh, or industrial transformers to uh, to upcycle? Um, is it because there's not really al that many alternatives than going to landfill or being composted? Uh, maybe the tech is too nascent and new innovation like yours uh, needs to be pushed. Maybe it's like on the economical side. I mean, what is the viable alternative? Is, uh, you know, because it sounds like the cost of uh, sometimes uh, uh, upcycling versus, uh, you know, putting into the landfills uh, is still like, uh, you know, more easy and, uh, and cheaper to, to dump everything. So what are your, what's your opinion in terms of those challenges and, uh, and opportunities? Yeah, I think the challenges are because of a lot of combinations of the things that you mentioned. Um, like the very first thing is that it is often a lot of times easier to just throw something away. It's not your problem anymore. Um, you don't have to treat it with any kind of, I guess, like respect almost like if you're going to treat and this is like one of the things with avocado seeds is just like if you're going to if we're going to use it to then make something that someone's going to consume, then that means that the entire supply chain, we have to make sure that it's food safe and handled and treated well. And you have to have quality check procedures around that. You need to like, someone's got to do all of that work and um, convincing someone to do that. That's at the moment paying $300 maybe for a truck to come and get rid of all of their problems is like pretty challenging and they have to be really excited about the idea of utilizing that food waste in other ways. Um, so there's just, there's that one section and there's the other section, which is just like, sometimes there is no information around how to handle that particular ingredient. And I can tell you that for our company, we've had a lot of challenges with that. So with avocado seeds, there's like for food safe handling, there's zero documentation about that. So it's like, we don't know what molds are affecting it. We don't know what packaging solutions work for that. We didn't know like even how many seeds would fit into a box, how many boxes would fit on a pallet, how much would that pallet weigh? Um, and then it's just like, what kind of a box? And like, if you look at the grocery store or the market, like there's so many solutions that have like so much R&D that has gone into making sure that the tomatoes that you buy at the grocery store will last the longest, you know? Um, the packaging for a tomato is completely different than packaging for spinach. And that's because tomatoes have um, anaerobic bacteria which will or, or molds that attack them. So that's why all of the tomato cartons will have holes in them so that they can breathe and that they don't get attacked. Whereas spinach is gonna be, you know, vacuum sealed with like um, additional carbon dioxide so that it doesn't, or nitrogen so that it doesn't start to, to decompose. So there's like a lot of thought and effort and time that has gone into engineering these things. And because people wanted spinach, because people wanted tomatoes, like there was a market for that, um, a lot of it made sense to invest all of that time and energy and resources into creating better solutions. So if you look at, we've gotten a lot better at how to handle 
like almost all of the crops that we grow. Um, but with the parts of food that are left behind, like it's starting from scratch. It's starting from zero. It's like we don't even know what the problems are, so we don't know how exactly to fix them. So, and it takes a lot of time to figure that out. Um, it takes a lot of trial and error. It takes a lot of R&D resources. It takes money. It takes people that care enough to do it. So I think all of those challenges come together, especially for upcycled foods, um, where it's not like, if I was starting a tea company, I could call anyone and place an order for tea and it would be at my doorstep maybe two weeks if, you know, at the latest. Um, with avocado seeds, it's a completely different story. Uh, when I first called to ask for avocado seeds, I was told that they don't even have them. And I was like, no, but you, you do because you process avocados. And they were like, yeah, but we don't have the seed. And I was like, hold on a second, let me just backtrack. You buy the full avocado, you're making pulp. So what happens with the rest of it? It's like, oh, that, we just throw that away. I was like, right, that's the part that I want. Like, you know, um, so it's, yeah, it's a pretty interesting challenge. And I think it's like financial, it's uh, soci social also, like people have to agree and do it because it's just at the end of the day, business is just about convincing people to do things um, <laughs> that you want them to do. Uh, so it's like there's that part. And then there's also just like sheer habit and financial, like, I guess it might not financially make sense to put someone on another shift to handle or like someone at the grocery store is making guacamole, but they don't have the additional time to wash the seeds. So it's just like, um, mm -hmm. who's going to pay for that? Who's going to pay for that extra labor? Um, and like, who's going to manage that? Who's going to manage the quality control? Who's going to manage all of those things? So I think that's where it comes in to like trying to figure out how to navigate this space and why it's more challenging than just like a regular food and beverage company. And do you think that uh, regulation at the food waste level is also something that could, uh, you know, accelerate and, and move the needle forward a, a more, I would say, mainstream market uh, upcycling? Uh, so how is the regulation today in the U.S.? Very, con I mean, um, is there new regulation that should be passed or is there is like maybe too many regulations that are blocking everything? Uh, how is the, the policy makers could, uh, you know, act on? Yeah, I don't think there's too much regulation around it at all. Um, and I think there's there's like a double edged sword with regulation um, around that. It's like it would be great if they forced everyone to think about it. But also at the same time, if they did force everyone to find something to do with their avocado seeds or like make sure that they don't go to landfill. Even if I were to go get all of those avocado seeds, I don't have the kind of customers to actually be able to use that. So it's just like, um, or like there's not enough brand awareness around the product that I'm trying to build um, to drive that kind of demand. So I don't know at this moment, like what exactly the regulation could be or would be that would actually be beneficial to the system. Um, mm. I think that it would more be in terms of like benefits to an organization, um, you know, like maybe they get tax dollars off or something like that um, for making better use of their ingredients. And I think that might be a better place to start than to have regulation that's like, okay, you got to do this, otherwise there's a fine because there might not be something for someone to do with whatever they're throwing away. Mm -hmm. So to, to close this uh, this section, uh, as everyone knows, there is often some you know controversy around uh, green, sustainable like uh, food products, and especially maybe some sometimes the, the one that uh, using like uh, you know uh, upcycled product. I would say, uh, I mean that could be maybe the taste that uh, could considered by uh, some uh, you know unpleasant, or the product in itself is not as sustainable uh, as it claims to be. So. According to you, what is necessary in the market today to ensure that uh, products have a, a real positive impact and not just like uh, just a buzz or greenwashing uh, tool that some producers are, are leveraging by dropping just a, a very tiny percentage of uh, that component and, uh, you know, uh, sell their greener or better or more sustainable like uh, product in itself? Yeah, uh, I think that's a great question um, because like, I guess there's the challenges around um, how a product tastes and like um, <clears throat> 
it's just like sometimes the parts that are being thrown away are being thrown away because you know, people couldn't figure out what to do with them. Um, you know, it's like, uh, I'm sure that every company wants to make the most of whatever um, raw materials that they're bringing in. So for them to want to throw something away, it's like, obviously, they haven't figured out what to do with it, um, or to do, you know, something that's like, interesting enough to a customer. So there's all of those pieces with, you know, uh, people being able to find the correct format for something to be in. So I'll give you an example with our avocado seed brew. Um, and the biggest challenge that we faced was when we first started, we didn't know what an avocado seed brew was supposed to taste like. Um, it can taste like anything. Um, and it's like, when you say, when you say anything, it's like a pretty wide, like it's like a moving target. You don't know what you're formulating for. Um, it could fit in anywhere in the beverage category, which means that we don't have an anchor point that, oh, it has to taste like iced tea or it has to taste like this. Um, it's its own thing. It has its own unique flavor. So it, it has to taste like itself. Um, but then where does that fit into the market, um, the landscape of the beverage industry for us? And it was just like going through and we did spend we spent like 18 months to kind of like really research that and to put it into the hands of customers to see how much they're willing to pay to see how to message that on our label to see how um to see what the customer expectation was when they heard an avocado seed brew and then how to like match that through a recipe and like um it sounds like a pretty easy thing to do but when you're thinking about doing this at scale and like it has to be appealing to the mass market so we went through eight different iterations um, in 18 months but that's like a run rate of like every two months almost we were back in the in the kitchen, back in the lab, like reformulating our beverage based on the feedback that we were getting. Um, and I think that's with upcycled foods, like I think they do take a little bit longer to take off um, because of the amount of like upfront R&D that needs to happen for even this product or idea to exist. And that's, I think, where it's a little bit scary for a lot of like VCs and like um, to get the right kind of funding because I mean, it is a technical risk. Like it could be that people just hate how avocado seeds taste. Um, and it could have been, but at least for us, we kind of navigated that and we figured it out. And I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of companies that figure it out. And on the other hand, a lot of companies that are just gonna have to pivot because the idea that they started with is just like, okay, this just does not work as a chip because that chip will never be, you know, crunchy. It's always going to be soggy. So maybe you don't do a chip. Maybe you do something else. Um, maybe you make cake instead. Um, so I think there is going to be like a bit of a discovery process with upcycled foods. Um, and that's like, yeah, that's kind of really up to the companies that are doing that to like put in that work and that effort to find the best way to highlight the ingredient that they've chosen to work with. And like in terms of greenwashing, that's a really hard one because I mean, it's so easy to like use one grain of, you know, upcycled something and then, you know, like, you know, oh yeah, we use like, you know, upcycled carrots, but then you made carrot cake and your recipe has like less than 2% carrots, um, you know, so there's, uh, I think the Upcycled Food Association is doing a really good job. They started a certification, which is Upcycle Certified. So there, what they do is they validate your system, your entire supply chain to make sure that all of the, the things that you're getting are actually coming from places that would have gone to land fill and then making sure that at the end of it that you didn't landfill the product that you got and they're also checking and verifying the recipes to make sure and um, there's like different guidelines that they have they have like different types of certification so you can like go see um, and like I think those type of certifications are going to be helpful for customers to like know that someone else has verified it because it's impossible for us as like customers to walk down the grocery store aisle and like figure that out um, or like stand there and like do all of this research. Um, so I think having certifications is going to be a good way to kind of like make sure that greenwashing doesn't happen. But at the same time, there has to be a way to make that inclusive because a lot of companies, like I said, that just are really struggling to find funding because it's such a radical idea. Um, they may have to do things with a lot fewer resources than companies that, you know, are doing the next, you know, plant-based milk, you know? Um, so they might have to do a lot 
more with a lot fewer resources and then mm -hmm. that gatekeeping of like who can get upcycle certified and like they have to have like some ways that smaller companies can get in without being like overburdened with having to get certified. Thank you so much for uh, all of those uh, very interesting insights on the you know food waste uh, and upcycling uh, landscape. So let's go deeper now into uh, hidden gems. I mean, you already uncovered uh, part of it. So, but what is the, the the story behind it? I mean, for who it is and uh, which initial gap that uh, that you guys identified at first that led you the you know to the, the current version of it. Uh, I mean, in a way, why did uh, hidden gems uh, have to exist? Yeah. So. Um... When uh, it really started when I made a bowl of guacamole for my class um, at Drexel University. I was at the Drexel Food Lab, made a bowl of guacamole for my whole class, and it was just like, had the smallest bowl of avocado pulp and like guacamole and had like this huge bowl of like seeds and peels. And I was like, okay, I call myself a food waste researcher. What can I do with this? Um, and that's really what sparked the whole, the whole business to start. Um, and... I guess like the the way that it went from there to where it is today, it's like been through hundreds of different journeys. So it's like the very, very first iteration of this was actually a tea bag. Um, and it was just like, I still remember there was an event and I found out about the event like the day before. And I was like, oh, I'm going to make this avocados. Can I like come and do a table? Can I make my tea? Can I like do this stuff? And it was at Drexel University. So they were like, okay, fine, like do whatever you want to do. Um, so I went in and like at the last minute realized like I don't have tea bags. Um, so like found a bunch of tea bags, dumped out the tea. Um, and then I was like filling my avocado seeds uh, in there to make tea. And I took it to this event and no one was interested. Um, <laughs> zero people were interested to even talk with me. Like I had my tea bags like laid out and like no one wanted to drink hot tea during an event. And I was like, ah, oh, that's terrible. Um, I'm going to come back next at the next event and I'm going to like brew this tea, like pre-brew it. And I'm going to serve hot tea. And um, that event did like a little bit better. At least some people had a conversation with me and I was like, this is the coolest idea. Like, why is no one interested? Like, you know, um, I have to get, I have to change something. And the next I was like, okay, I'm going to make an iced tea because like people are drinking cold things at events. So went from doing a hot tea to doing an iced tea. And then after get, getting to the iced tea phase was really when I was like starting to think about, okay, where would this fit in? Like, I can't have another iced tea. Like that's boring. Um, no one cares. Um, and then did a lot of discovery about, um, just like asking questions to people about like what they're drinking, why they're drinking it, what choices they're making, what do they wish was different? Um, what would they drink if they like their dream drink? Like, what would that be? Um, and we found that there were a lot of people that um, love the idea of kombucha. They want to drink kombucha because they want all the gut health benefits, but a lot of them weren't able to drink it for a lot of reasons. Some of it was because carbonation is like, you know, it causes bloating. Some other people weren't drinking it because of the amount of sugar that was in it. Um, a lot of people weren't drinking it because it was too pungent of a flavor. So it was just like, okay, well, this is something that we can work with. There's a lot of people, like as the kombucha category is growing and more people are getting awareness about the fact that you can, you know, eat and drink um, the foods that will like support your gut health, there's, there's definitely a market that's being created for that. And at the same time, there's a lot of people that are being left out of it. And then we started to move into figuring out how we can kind of fit into that category. What should our beverage taste like? Like what are the different um, claims that we should be making? Um, so we kind of moved into that from like, it's such a different world from where we first started, which was like a tea bag. Um, but it did go through lots of iterations to come to where it is today. Yeah, thank you so much. I think it's a very uh, in inspiring uh, story of uh, successive uh, iteration to, uh, to reach out something that uh, looks... Uh, and I didn't have the chance yet to, to try it out, but uh, I will definitely, uh, during my next uh, trip to the US, try, try to catch at least one bottle. <laughs> 
So let's speak a bit more about the, the product side in itself. Like, I mean, if you can walk us through the, the process for non-scientists, as I like to ask, like, how, how does it work? I mean, what are the, the elements that you uh, take out of the Advocado seeds? And you, you mentioned some uh, antioxidant. Is this anything else? Like, how do you extract uh, them? And, and do they need like specific, I guess, transformation? Uh, what is the, the ratio of uh, Advocado, Adv Advocado seeds uh, extract versus uh, the other component uh, that par are part of the, the recipe? Uh, what's left over of the uh, unused uh, of the of the seeds? Uh, I mean, and, and how, how much do, do, do you need for, you know, for a bottle of juice? Um, I mean, if you can ask, help us visualize a little bit like this or like uh, product size, uh, you know, uh, secret sauce that uh, that you have there. Yeah, so we get all of our avocado seeds from people who have a lot of avocados. So whether that is restaurants or if it's like people that make guacamole, so people that do it at scale. So we go over there, we get their avocado seeds. We have to get the we have to get to them within four hours um, if they're not refrigerated. And if they are refrigerated, we have two days to get there. So we get there in you know, the right amount of time, uh, we pick them up, we clean them, we wash them. And then after that, we can store them in the freezer at the moment. So that's how we like build up our stockpile of avocado seeds. Um, and then once we have enough, what we do is that we uh, extract the antioxidants out of the avocado seeds. So the antioxidants in an avocado are very similar to those that you find in um, tea and as well as in uh, wine. So there's lots of like tannins, polyphenols, like all of these really good things that um, are great for your body. Um, so what we do is that we extract the avocado seeds. I don't want to get into the details of how we do that because we are filing for a patent on that right now. So I mean, I kind of skip over that part but um after we're done what we can do is that we extra uh we have a lot of like this actual seed that's left over so the interesting thing is that before avocado seeds are like really hard and they don't compost well at all um, sometimes they, they do not fit into commercial composters they will break a commercial composter so all of those go to landfill and then um sometimes like the larger scale the ones that are doing it like outside they tend not to accept a lot of avocado seeds because they don't really break down. Um, so sometimes people do send them, but it's like really rare that uh, commercial facilities will even accept avocado seeds. But after we're done with them, they actually break down enough to, in a compost facility, break down within a week. And um, it's really interesting that the avocado seeds provide a lot of pulp and uh, that is like a good complement to a lot of the I, if you've seen like the compostable plastics like the spoons and the the bowls and all of that stuff they need a certain ratio of like actual raw organic material um, to break down so um, the avocado seeds actually provide that for a lot of our compost facilities when we do send them over so it's just like hundreds of pounds of additional stuff to like help break down some of the other things so then they get composted and then they get completely taken out of the landfill. And the extract is actually what forms the base of our drink. So our drink is actually 97% avocado seed extract. And every bottle will have like the equivalent of approximately two avocado seeds in every bottle. Um, and then we add in our apple cider vinegar, our flavors, like our allulose, which is our sweetener. Um, and we do malic acid. So it's just like five ingredients. All of them are natural ingredients. and um, everything is like nice and clean label like just how we want it um so yeah and then we make our drink and then our drink gets put into the market so it's a pretty uh cool process and i think it's starting to look better every day i'm sure but uh, i like to understand a little bit more on the, the production uh process so you mentioned like the whole uh process but like who is like in charge of like the transformation of that i mean are you still doing that for, out of your uh, kitchen uh do you have like access to a, a special like facilities that uh, is certified in a way to uh, you know uh, treat and, and 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 transform uh you know foods in a, on a, in a safer manner i i would say uh, and how do you see like the um you know scalability of uh, this uh, the, the, this production i mean do you see yourself like uh, owning those facilities licensing the the recipe to a larger um, maybe uh, beverage uh, you know producers tell us a bit more about that yeah so um 
the last, uh, during, I guess, like our pilot, a large part of what we did was we did all of the manufacturing in-house, like at, um, we worked with Rutgers Food Innovation Center. So they have a pilot facility that's in Bridgeton, New Jersey. So what we did was that we would go there and then they have the equipment that, and we would just rent out their bottling line. So we could go in, we could like do all of our tests. So we basically updated our production process every time that we were there along with the recipe. So you can, as you can tell, like it was a crazy, crazy uh, a couple of like, you know, 18 months uh, to go through that every single time. Um, but it is now really scalable. So now you can, we can make, uh, we've kind of divided our avocado seed brewing process into like two. So one is where we do, we do the extraction and we make a concentrate and that concentrate is shelf stable. So we can like transport it easily. And then the last part is where they actually add in the flavors and that's where, like where it turns into the final drink. Um, so we, are working with a facility, a co-packing facility that does the second part right now. Um, so we don't handle that piece so much anymore. And then we, the concentrate piece, actually, we're looking to work with different companies that can make that for us closer to the source of where the avocado seeds are. So, um, I mean, it is something that we would eventually be able to license to other people. And we did build it in a way that we don't need some crazy, you know, million dollar equipment to make it happen. We worked really hard on making sure that it was scalable and that pretty much any facility that had that basic equipment would be able to make it, obviously with some tweaks and edits. Um, to what they would normally do. But yeah, so we've kind of changed all of that around and started to build out that process and that ecosystem of people that are really excited about what we're doing and like willing to follow through. And that, that was also another thing that was really interesting to me was a lot of production facilities, especially for beverage, like don't even have composters that come over. Like they don't work with anyone. And it was just like, oh, OK, this is like a brand new thing that I, you know, we're having to figure out from the beginning. It's like, oh, you don't compost. It's like you're a food facility, but you don't compost. It's like, OK, um, let's start over from the beginning. Let's like go find out who's, you know, going to be able to service this and like pick up the quantities that we need to have picked up. Um, so, yeah, going through all of that stuff has been pretty fun, but um, it's definitely scalable and it took a while to get there. Um, but we're there now. So what are the current uh, and expected economics of uh, Inland Gems? I mean, uh, how much does it cost to uh, produce? I mean, I have access to these uh, to, to those facilities and those uh, suppliers, access to, the, uh, to the, the, the raw material. So do you get paid for uh, taking over those avocado seeds and uh, manage that, uh, uh, that waste? Or do you pay for it? Um, I mean, what's the cost maybe per, per, per liter that uh, you guys are doing? Uh, Tell us a bit more about the business model and your maybe future projection. Yeah, so um, during our pilot, we were not making any money. We were just making it almost at cost. Like it was pretty expensive for us to make that product. And a lot of that just has to do with like labor, um, doing really small production runs, like everything was just bought like, you know, sometimes on Amazon, like it's just like the worst possible way to do things, but then we needed to do them in like a small way so that we could kind of, you know, make sure that everything was fine. And we knew that we weren't going to like repeat that process, at least at that time. It was just like, we didn't know it was still a test. So um, now that we have like our formulation and all of that stuff figured out, we're able to start working on like bringing down our cost of goods. So right now we're still at like a 37% profit margin, which is not great, but um, in the like, when we do scale it up, we're projecting to be able to get up to 79% of a profit margin on every unit. So that's pretty exciting, um, like good economics there. And I think financially very feasible. Um, I guess the, the parts of this that are still like question marks is that we, like for the avocado seeds, like we from restaurants got them for free and um, from larger guacamole manufacturers, like they throw that stuff away. They actually pay for waste removal um, and we could potentially get paid for that. But at the same time, we need to have a process that uh, makes sure that they are treating the avocado seeds in a food safe way and for them to do that that's definitely an economical because somebody's got to take care of that someone has to document that someone has to take care of that paperwork so that for us that we are able to you know make sure that 
it is food safe and that if something does go wrong that we could trace it back and figure out what happened. Um, so for those things, like, and for washing, cleaning, like all of those things are expensive, like time consuming steps. So we definitely pay for all of that stuff. So while it might feel like, oh, avocado seeds are free or we could get paid for um, picking up the ingredient, um, there is a lot of other processing that's like associated with that, which is like makes it, I guess, like the same as a raw material that you would pay for. Um, the cool thing about that is that as we do scale up and have all of like, uh, like I said, like avocado seed beverage is just one of the many things that we want to do. And avocado seeds are being studied for lots of different things. Like um, they've been shown to be able to pull heavy metals out of water so they can actually remove lead from water, which is really cool. So you can make a water filter, uh, filtration system. The antioxidants from the avocado seeds have been shown to help preserve um, foods, especially things with like high fatty acids in them. They could be a cosmetic ingredient or a cosmetic preservative. Um, pharmaceutical companies are studying avocado seeds for various uses. So like once there's more industry around it, I think these things will become much more economical in the future. Um, and the idea is to be able to like kickstart that, build all the IP, build the technology, build the knowledge, the database that then can be shared with the other companies that are in this space so that um, they can do things safely and not have to start over from the beginning like we did. So can you tell us a bit more about your uh, competition today? I mean, you mentioned that like, uh, kombucha, other kombucha types of uh, drinks uh, are part of the same categories. Uh, I guess you, you're the only one uh, using avocado seeds, so you probably don't have a direct competitors in that sense. Uh, uh, I mean, how do you, I mean, who are they? How are you different and maybe better? Um, if you can, you know, tell us a bit more about uh, the competition yeah. itself. I would say that we're like squarely between two categories. We're like between iced tea and kombucha. So it's like still a functional beverage. It's made from natural, natural ingredients. Like it has all the same stuff that a lot of, I feel like the higher end iced teas are. And then uh, even kombuchas like have that same thread going through them. And then like iced teas can be kind of honestly, in my opinion, kind of boring and kind of flat, like very one dimensional in flavor, whereas kombucha is like a 10, you know, in terms of like craziness on flavor. Um, and so what we're looking at being is somewhere on a five, like, you know, it's not boring. It's not crazy. It's somewhere in the middle. It's like, you know, um, it's still a pleasurable journey to like or an experience to drink it. And every sip is like its own journey in itself, um, which I find to be fun. So it's more elevated than something that's like an iced tea, but it's not all the way crazy um, like a kombucha. And it has all the same health benefits as a kombucha, which means that it's got better functional components than what a, an iced tea would have, because ours has three times more antioxidants than a green tea. So it's like better on that front. And then um, on the kombucha category, like we still have all the same gut health benefits from the apple cider vinegar as a kombucha would have. Um, so it's like a good combination between the two. Okay, so last question on uh, on my side for this uh, this focus on uh, on the company. So, what is the, the estimate size of the the market opportunity here that uh, we're talking about? I mean, like, and maybe how are you planning to uh, to scale? You mentioned a little bit like, uh, but the, the production side, but also like, what's your uh, uh, go to market strategy in terms of like uh, distribution channel because um, you know i guess uh, the, the whole food of the world uh, might be excited to have you but what is the minimum quantity that you need when can you uh, go up to there i mean what are the the, the, the steps that you need to uh, achieve now to go to uh, a larger scale and what is that scale uh, anyway what's next for uh, inner gems yeah, so I mean, the beverage, the functional beverage category is like a $48 billion market in the US. So it's a pretty big market. Um, there's a lot of different players in it. So we definitely have like our little niche in that market. Um, so the, the our distribution strategy is really to start out with like natural retail and where people that are in our target audience shop a lot. So like different co-op stores, people like Whole Foods. Um, so like these like, I guess like the more natural focused um, 
and a healthier and more like aware of sustainability type of audience. Um, and really for us at this time, it's like now we've started to figure out like how to scale up our product and scale up production. So we're, we're pretty much there. So now we're looking to bring on like a distributor that can actually help us to get there or like a lead retailer that's gonna like be our anchor to get us into distribution, um, which should be able to help us really grow. So, I mean, we are talking with a lot of like potential lead, um, like retail, uh, retail locations. And I mean, there is like, again, like for an upcycled product, sometimes there's like additional regulation, not regulation, but like re additional information that we have to provide because they need to like make sure that your food is safe and like, you know, have that documentation. They kind of want to see it, you know. Um, so there's like a lot of different pieces of that, which like for another company or a traditional company might not have to provide all that information. So it might be like a lot faster and sales cycles might be faster in the beginning. So we've definitely seen slower sales cycles because of that. Mm -hmm. um, but hopefully that should change sometime soon. Are you uh, FDA approved or is it something mandatory or not mandatory for uh, your type of product? So actually, um, FDA doesn't mandate um, anyone for a food product to have to be okay. certified. Um, it is optional. So we are planning to prepare for an FDA generally recognized as safe notice. Um, but in the meantime, what we did was we got what you call a self-affirmed generally recognized as safe, where you would like hire a panel of experts to go through all of the same data that you would you know, submit to the FDA and they'll like certify that for you. But with the FDA, there's like a lot of other pieces that you have to do. And like um, some of the testing that they need you to do is like $250,000. So it's definitely a pretty expensive process. And um, it makes sense to do that when you've already like know that you have enough demand to make that valuable mm -hmm. and worth it. So what's your personal opinion on the on the climate crisis? I mean, what would be your words uh, to people who are afraid of all the terrible consequences that uh, we already see today? Wildfire, flood, um, you know, glacier collapsing uh, and, and, and so are we doomed? Or, I mean, what, what would you tell them? I mean, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I think that there's still time to change it. And I think um, like I know sometimes it's really unfair to put this into like, you know, the customers um, on the customer's plate. But at the end of the day, like we are the ones that drive uh, market trends. So for us to be like really aware of that and demand it and buy the products that, you know, kind of vote with your money um, is what I can say is just like, you know, make sure that you're spending your money in the way that you with companies that you trust will spend it in the right way. And that's kind of like what my philosophy has been even for hidden gems is that like we're really careful about the kind of suppliers that we choose and where we're spending our money. And we try to find companies that are like minority or women owned businesses to work with. So like, you know, um, just like, yeah, be a little vote with your money and just try to make your voice heard. I don't think that um, we're, we're there yet. We still have some time. Um, and even if it's like we're not able to hit those goals, we can still do better. So better late than never, I guess. Um, so, yeah, I think we're I mean, either way, we're here. So we got to do what we can do. <laughs> So for uh, Hidden Gems, I mean, what keeps you up at night and uh, how can the listeners of, uh, you know, investors, founders, uh, experts uh, listening to the show can help you? Well, yeah, um, we are fundraising right now, so it would be great to get some good introductions or if anyone's interested to talk more, I would love that. Um, and other than that, really, like if anyone has really good connections with the avocado industry, um, those would be really helpful from pretty much all over the world. Um, so we have good connections here in the U.S. and in a little bit in Mexico, but like definitely people that have uh, there's so many other countries that work with avocados. So um, that would be really useful, too. And um, if there's anyone here that's like a packaging expert, I would love to talk with you because um, I think there's some cool packaging solutions that we can build um, to kind of help with what we're doing here. And hopefully we can use that um, for other ingredients as well. Any question that I did not ask you that I should have for this uh, first part of the uh, interview? Uh, no, I think, I think we covered all the different pieces really well.
Hi, it's Guillaume again. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show. As I said, do not hesitate to share an episode with a friend. Also, if you value the work we do for the climate tech ecosystem, here is how you can contribute to it. Today, I'm asking for your support and a donation or sponsorship to make the work of our self-funded team more viable. Even a small contribution means a lot to us. In any case, I will invite you to subscribe to our channels and visit our website startupbasecamp.org to discover more episodes like this one and get your membership to access all our members' exclusive content. So remember, all of this is possible because of your support and donation. And we want you to be part of this collective movement against climate change. Let's keep in touch and I hope you will enjoy our next show with us.